All right. We're going to begin a series of teaching here that's going to be very crucial to us walking in the fullness of God. Simply going to call it Bible doctrines. And doctrines of the church are so crucial to what people believe. And it's my desire as a pastor, as a shepherd, as a minister of the gospel, that people live according to the doctrines of the church, the doctrines of Jesus Christ. I've said many times that if we don't understand what the Word says and how spiritual laws operate, we'll create our own. When we operate within the laws of God and operate within the laws of Jesus Christ and say His Word is what, is what stands supreme in my life, and we put faith up on His Word and through His Word, then Jesus has to be Lord over His Word. Now, what happens is people like to come up with their own doctrines. They like to come up with their own uh, theories, their own way of believing things, and they create their own spiritual laws. And when they create their own spiritual laws, then they have to be Lord over their own law. And you cannot be Lord over your own laws. You're not good enough to do that. And because of it, people are suffering and they're struggling in life. And it was never God's intention for people to suffer and struggle in life. And so these doctrines of the church were not established by some preacher. They were established by the Word of God himself, but by the Word of God itself, and what God says and how God believes his church and his people should be. So uh, I'm going to begin reading some verses of Scripture today, and then we're just going to get into this. Today I'm going to talk about why is doctrine necessary? Why are Bible doctrines necessary? And then we're going to get into some Bible doctrines starting the next time we're together. Uh, during the time that we're together, we're going to talk about not only, uh, not only why is it necessary, we're going to talk about things, deals with uh, theology, uh, soteriology, uh, we're going to deal with pneumatology, we're going to deal with angelology, uh, uh, ecclesiology, or the ecclesia, the church, which means the called out ones, the body of Christ. We're going to deal with eschatology. We're going to deal with things like the ordinance of the church, uh, which covers a lot of things. And so within this teaching, we're going to be able to really uh, dive into some areas that will refresh us. People that are not students of the Word of God will find, will find herself uh, more uh, apt to study it because it's going to bring excitement. People who have been students of the Word that are watching these videos, that are, that are listening to what's happening, uh, they're not only going to be excited about it, but they're going to want to even dive into it more and uh, glean more from what the Bible says. I believe that Christians ought to know more about what they believe than anyone else. Than any other anyone else. Years ago, uh, Brother Wayne was was with me, and uh, we took a group of people into Chicago, where Dave Robinson purchased that building, and we went into Chicago there uh, to do some street witnessing. It was like an inner city mission trip, and during that time we were there, they set up a whole. A lineup of activities you know what streets we're going to go to and they had different teachings on how to minister on the streets and so forth and so on and uh brother wayne was at plainview at the time and so uh you know i think he brought a few and and then uh there were some came from florida and so forth and there's about 19 of us total but one of the things that we did we went into a mosque we went into an islamic mosque and they allowed us to come in there uh, we did not sneak in or whatever. They allowed us to come in. And we, as men, were able to go sit against the back wall and observe their prayer time. The ladies could not go into the mosque area or the sanctuary area that we would know, whatever they call that inner area. They had to sit out in the hall area. But the men were able to go in, and we observed their prayer. Uh, it didn't bother them that we were there. Uh, it wasn't a thing that you felt threatened or anything of such. I mean, it was really an uh, interesting time to see what was going on. After that, they had it set up. We went upstairs, and there was a large room with a large table in it, and we gathered around, and we sat with the leaders of the Islamic mosque that we're in, we were in. And so questions started coming up about what we believed. And 
then all of a sudden they started stating why they were right and why we were wrong. Now, I understand why they made this available because they wanted to show us that we are so doctrinally wrong and they're right and how that we have changed our Bible and what we believe and they've never changed their holy scriptures that they consider their holy scriptures. They never changed that. And so... They started asking questions, and uh, some of our people, and, and uh, I think we had a pendy with us at the time, and, and they started asking questions, and, and people sitting there. We had, you know, teenagers and older teenagers and some adults, and I sat there and got totally frustrated, not at them, but at us, because I was so bothered that we could not defend biblically what we believed. Now, and I can't say all of us, but the general consensus that we could not defend what we believed. Am I right? And we could not defend that, and, and they would say, well, that's just because of, of what we believe. Why is it? And this guy that was there and another one was able, they said, could quote their Quran verbatim. To get to that level that they were in, they could quote it. And they were able to say, well, this one said this and this one said that. And the best we could get, well, that's what my mom and grandmother taught me and whatever. And we could not defend the faith. I had never been so agitated. We got out of there and we went back to the room, went back to the church area, and we had a debriefing. And I made a commitment right then and there. That I'm never going to let anybody, especially when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, my Redeemer, for anybody to make me feel like they know more about it than I do. Or they know more about what they believe than I know more about what I believe when it comes to Him. And so something got inside of me a resolve that I never want to be in a position where I'm trying to fight and scramble for for an answer over something that I said, this is what I live for. This is what I live for. This is who Jesus Christ really is, and this is why he died, and I know why he died. And I don't have to study other world religions to prove that mine is right. Because I'm a student of the Bible and of the Word of God, and we know what we know is right. And I realized right then, just because people call themselves Christians, that if you get around other people, you could become outclassed real quick where others have disciplined themselves to study what they believed, right, wrong, or indifferent. I'm not saying it. And sit there and watch people that say they're Christians and can't even defend the faith that they said they're willing to serve. You know why the people are willing to die for what they believe? Because they've studied and they believe it's right, and they're willing to stand for that. And why some Christians can't even stay saved more than five and six years without backsliding is because they really don't know what they believe. And I believe to stop a lot of this, we've got to, we've got to get a resolve on the inside of us. This is what we believe, and this is why we believe what we believe. And what this is all built up on foundations that we know called Bible doctrines. And if we don't get the foundation right, nothing else is going to be right. And so when I came out of that inner city trip, I started really picking up the business when it came to making sure we understood where I preached at, when I I sat with people and I taught, that uh, business started picking up in my life on we've got to know. And I've always felt that in my heart. The primary call of my life was to teach people who they are in Christ. And we ought to be able to defend what we believe. I met with a group of people since I've been here. And I asked, do we all believe in divine healing? And everybody believed in divine healing. And I asked, who could give me five scriptures to support? Off the top of their head without looking at Five scriptures to support it. Five to seven scriptures that off the top of your head without looking Five to seven scriptures, and not one person could give me five scriptures. Now, they could say, well, I know this and this and that, but I'm talking about being able to establish yourself and give something, this is what I believe. And I believe this is what these doctrines will do. And when you get the foundations right, everything that you pick or extract from these doctrines 
you'll be able to build everything else off of because this is what it will spring from. Amen? And so uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles. I'm going to read a couple verses of scriptures, and we're all going to be for a while, uh, especially today in the book of Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy and some 2 Timothy. So uh, let's go to the book of uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them. That, they, that thy profiting may appear to all. Verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now I'm going to read this verse 16 again. Because this is going to be the heart of it. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So the reason why I want to understand this, I want myself to be saved and and, uh, preserved, and I want those who hear me to be saved and preserved. Amen? So let's let's look at this. Uh, Till I come, give attendance to reading. Now, reading what? We better be reading the Word of God. Or, and uh, materials pertaining to the Word of God. Now, I realize there's some good novels out there that people enjoy reading, and, and, I'm not, and I will not be the, the one to say that you can't read it. Now, if anything is, is that induces fear in your life, that induces bad things in your heart, or, or causes you to uh, get off track, then I would lay that down, and I wouldn't give my attention to that. You know, I came to a conclusion a long time ago, even though my kids don't agree with it and everything else, but uh, there are just certain things that I, I won't watch, and there are certain things I won't allow my family to watch. That's just, that's just me. And uh, I believe with everything in me, there's enough chaos and confusion walking around school hallways and, and places of work and through the town and the Walmarts and Kmarts and everywhere else. There's enough foul language and enough crazy talk and enough, uh, you know, stupidity that I don't need to go pay Hollywood or some movie theater to put more into me. Now, that's just my, my belief. Now, there's people here uh, that says, I don't believe it's wrong to see this and to do that and watch that. Well, you know, every man will rise and fall according to his own belief system. You have to understand that. Every man will rise and fall to his own belief system. And so, uh, personally, I, I, want, I want life to be inside of me. See, I still get convicted, and uh, even though I override this conviction at times, I get convicted by doing things to scare people. I mean, I I get a great joy out of uh, making people, you know, get air when they jump. I mean, uh, there's just something about it. I just just like it, man, Uh, going into a place and, and just get people to just, you know. But the Lord dealt with me on that, that I called you to put faith in your kids and not fear. But every now and again, you know, I'll divert, fall out of remission a little bit, and uh, do something. And sometimes it happens by accident. When it happens by accident, I don't have any guilt and get to enjoy the product. The other day, somebody squeezed Angel, and she let out a yell. And when she did, the person wasn't expecting it, and they yelled and jumped. I said, I loved it, man. I mean, that was just, that was just a great reaction. But I don't, like to, I don't like to watch things and do things that produces fear. Produces fear. I remember years ago, this was years ago, this shows back. There's a movie that came on called Arach- uh, Arachnophobia about spiders. And people were dying over this specific, specific spider. 
And after that, man, people got into fear about spiders and spiders crawling. And, man, you watched, you watched just fear. And then the movie Twisters come out. And people were fearful about uh, tornadoes and, and all this other stuff. And what people watch, it produces something inside of them. So there are certain things I just won't put into my spirit because I don't want to fill it with a bunch of death and confusion. And the same thing is, when it comes to the Word of God, I want to give myself, I want to give attention to the reading of the Word of God. Reading the Word. Uh, reading the Word of God will, would, will cause something to happen on the inside of you. Now, not, not long ago, someone says, Pastor, I, I love the Word of God. I love God, but reading is just something that I have a hard time staying focused upon. I said, well, I tell you what, then you take, you take the Word of God on some audio form, either on your smartphone or a tablet or, or whatever, and you take the Bible and let them read it to you. We used to have Bible on cassette. Now we got Bible on CD, but now you can have Bible on your phone, and it will read to you. And sometimes by the way they uh, put emphasis in their voice, and especially they got some... Uh, some Bible reading programs where they got two and three people reading, first party, second party, and third party, that really brings it together. And maybe if you follow along, that will just get more into you. You say, well, I don't want to stop here. I just want to keep reading. And so whatever you've got to do, give attendance. Give attendance to reading. Not just reading, but reading the Word of God. There's something about reading the Word of God that just brings life. Uh, Years ago, uh, some of you have heard the story, but years ago, this, goes to, this ties into what I want to bring a point. I was in a meeting that lasted five weeks in East Texas with Ron Witt, and it was a supernatural Holy Ghost meeting. And I canceled my plane ticket, you know, a couple times to stay there to do the meeting, I, and I postponed some other trips I had preaching in Florida and Louisiana and so forth to stay there. You know, the pastors understood that if it happened in their church, they would want to continue the meeting. And, and so everybody was just cordial about it. But after about the third time I was ready to extend the, the, my ticket to stay in Texas, uh, they raised the price of the ticket. It's going to be like $350. Now, $350 is a cheap ticket to fly to Texas now, but that was very expensive then to change one. So I flew home, left all of my stuff there, and flew home on a Saturday afternoon, spent Saturday evening with Angel and Maddie, and as they got up and went to church on Sunday morning, I headed back to Texas in my car. And I, I was just outside of Little Rock on Interstate 40, had been driving all day, and I'm just crying out to God. I mean, the presence of God was in the car, and, and uh, I'm driving and praying and crying because I don't know what else to do. Uh, I don't know what friend to call that's been in a meeting that's lasted three weeks, four weeks like that to say, what do you do when you get to this point? Because it was so, uh, what God was doing was so spontaneous in the meetings, uh, people just interrupted me about every service. Came up in the middle of my preaching and started getting born again or, or crying out to God. And so it was just, it was a real move of God. And on my way back, the Lord dealt with me. He dealt with me in 1985, 86 in Tulsa, but he dealt with me. He said, I told you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John three times on your knees in the next 30 days, and you'll see me greater than you've ever seen me before. So as soon as I got to Texas, I got right on my knees with the word of God and began reading it in Texas. At the 30th day, I was doing a meeting in a place in Florida, a small town in Florida, and I was staying in this little, not a hotel, just a little motel, uh, uh, you know, about like what we have up the street. This may have been better uh, up the street here. And so I was staying inside of that, and I was kneeling at the end of the bed, and I read the last part of those scriptures. And when I did, it's like God's presence came into that room, and it's like a reward for being faithful and obedient. And I started seeing things about Jesus and revelation about the Word of God that I didn't have before. And a lot of people have asked me, how, how did you get, how did you see into some of these stories? Or how, did you, how do you get the revelation you got when you read the Word of God? Well, I don't know when it all came, but I know it started when I started giving attendance to reading the Word of God. And it happened when I did it on my knees because I was directed to the Spirit of God to do so. So everything is going to be based from the Word of God. So he says, give attendance to reading the Word, all right? 
to exhortation, to exhortation, to preaching or to teaching. Give attendance. He's telling Timothy, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to, to exhortation, to the preaching of it, uh, to the reading of it. Uh, then he says to doctrine, doctrine. Now notice he didn't say just read the word of God. He didn't say just preach the word of God. He says give attendance to reading, give attendance to exhortation, to preaching, and give, a, and give attendance to or give your full attention to doctrine as well. Now, what is doctrine? Doctrine is like a systematic belief. This is what we believe. They call it systematic theology at times and, and systematic belief. This is our belief system. This is, this, is what we, this is what we do. And we give attendance to this. Now, I spent two years at Ramah, and I learned so much about the Word of God, but it was just a Bible training. And then I end up getting my bachelor's degree, I finished it up and got my bachelor's degree in theology. And then I end up going on and finished up my master's since I've been here pastor and master's of theology, the study of God or the study of the things of God. And so this system, doc, doctrine is your belief. It's, it's what you believe. If you've got good doctrine, you've got, you got a good life. If you are stuck on bad doctrine, I'm sure there's a lot of bad things going on in your life. So give attention to doctrine. Then he says, neglect not the gift which was put in you when people laid hands on you. 15, he said, so meditate on these. Meditate on what? Meditate on the word. Meditate on, on the exhortations. And then on the doctrines that you have. Meditate on them. And then he says, verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. There it is again, unto the doctrine. He put a lot of emphasis on the doctrine, didn't he? And so we're going to talk, break these doctrines down, but I just want to give you uh, the necessary uh, things that you need to know about it. Uh, unto the doctrine, continue in them, continue. That means don't just, don't just get them. Remember John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, it says, uh, Jesus said to the Jews that just believed, if you continue in my word, then you shall be my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's something about continuing in these things that makes the difference. A lot of people start off, but they never continue. Dieting is one thing. You know, Monday. Monday is the most popular day to start dieting. Monday. I don't know how many Mondays that I was going to start eating different. Matter of fact, I, I talked about it last week about this Monday. And somebody brought me some nice, sweet things in yesterday I wouldn't expect it. And, you know, I don't want to fail them and let them down. So uh, I'm going to start tomorrow, maybe. But the whole point is, any time that I've set my heart that this is the day I'm doing it, it didn't matter what happened, I did it. But you know why that I keep saying Monday and Monday and maybe Tuesday? is because I haven't established it in my heart. That's what I really want yet. Once you establish something, this is what you want, this is how you're going to do it. I mean, people couldn't pry your mouth and put a donut in it. But until you get that established, you'll just keep doing it and just keep putting it off, keep putting it off, you know, and uh, so forth. So, so you have to doctrine your belief system. What you believe will, will dictate and guide your life. Continue in them, not continue in them, them doctrines, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and, thou shalt, and, and those who hear you. Now go over to uh, 2 Timothy, if you would. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Being that our belief systems are so important, you will live according to what you believe. I want you to understand that. You will live according to what you believe. Here's another saying that I've said for years. People can say anything they want to say, but they're only going to do what they really believe. Remember me saying that? People can say whatever they want, but they're only going to do or walk out or perform what they really believe. And so it doesn't matter what you say. It's what you believe. Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Not so much unto man, but unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you can rightly divide it, that tells us it can be 
wrongly divided. So he wants us to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what God wants us to do to build a rightly divided. If we're teaching, if we're preaching, if we're sharing the gospel on the street to our, to our uh, co-worker on the job or whatever, we need to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, so then he says in verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So he's talking about rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun other things. And I believe those verses are there. So we want to rightly divide. During this time that we have together, over the next several weeks that we study uh, what church doctrines are and the doctrines of the church and Bible doctrines, I want us to know that uh, we're going to be one that's not going to ever have to be ashamed of what we know and what we believe, okay? Uh, our belief system will guide our life. Our doctrine is a, our doctrine is a very proven thing, and, and that's what I love about it. Once you get the doctrine, it's very proven. Now, there's different doctrines that you have, or there's different types of people that try to preach doctrine. And there's, there's a there's, let me just use two things. I mentioned one a couple weeks ago. Uh, there is a doctrine or a belief system called Calvinist. And uh, they have five main points. Now, they have some of the same church doctrines that we have, but they have five main points within that doctrine. And then there's a doctrine called the Armenians. The Armenians believe that if you mess up one time, you've lost your salvation and everything. The Calvinist believes no matter what you do, you're eternally secured, you, you, you're, you're safe all the way to the end. I mean, they, they believe all the way to the sovereignty of election and so forth and so on, and, and you're, you're safe all the way to the end. But when two people disagree, it doesn't matter if you're Calvinist, if you're Armenian, if you're this or that, there's one thing <clears throat> that people that study the Word of God are considered as theologians or so forth and so on. There's one thing that we always go back to, and that is what happened at the cross, what happened at Calvary, what happened at redemption. And even though we may not believe your five points or your three points or your seven points, even though we may not buy into everything you say, we're going to go back in that God sent his only, his only begotten son to this earth that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So let's just shake hands and believe and agree on what we do agree on, but let's, let's make sure we keep the main thing, the main thing. So uh, these, this is something that we really look at and we watch hallelujah this is these are things that are very important because of bad doctrines people get messed up on things such as is god's will for you to be sick or you are to make you sick or god will take your children uh god will always test you to make sure you will follow his plans and and if, uh, if people have been taught these things and they hear it, it all makes sense to them. But when you get the foundation of the doctrines, your belief system uh, will really break through and you'll walk in victory. And uh, you'll never be the same again. Your belief, system, your, your belief system that God will make you, your belief system in God, or what you believe in God will either make you or break you. And that's what it is. And... It makes a lot of people, and what they believe, it breaks a lot of people. You know, I really didn't think that people really believed in that it's God's will for them to be sick until I started running into them. You know, I heard people preach this for years. I'm thinking, well, that doctrine has been annihilated a long time ago until I preached in a church about 15, 20 minutes from here. And this lady came, and people were being healed, man, all over uh, that uh, that altar area that night and i said uh, you believe when i lay hands on you you'll be healed yeah except if god's trying to teach me something now what would god be trying to teach you my sister and i we went through this about three or four times so the question i like to ask have you been going to the doctor for this well yeah well if you're not convinced that if you're not convinced that this isn't god and you think this could be God putting you through this, I think you'd be risking yourself by going to a doctor. Why would you want to be outside the will of God? If I believe this was the will of God for me to be sick, you think I'm going to go to the doctor and be out of the will of God? Absolutely not. 
But you're going to the doctor because you want better. Because deep down inside of you, you really believe. You really don't believe it's God's will for you to be this way. But somewhere in her theology, she was taught that God will make you sick to teach you something. Now, let me ask a question. You're sitting here. According to the Bible, who is the teacher? Sickness and disease or the Holy Ghost? Isn't that amazing? He sent his spirit to teach us and to guide us, but people have got a bad doctrine somewhere, and that doctrine controls their life because now they think sickness and disease becomes the teacher and not the spirit of God through the word of God. To me, it's, rightly, it's, it's easy to divide. So you rightly divide the word of truth. So uh, I've eventually laid hands on her, but the last thing she said, well, if, as long as it's not God's will. So that tells me she's never found the will of God. She, you know what the sad part is? She's an older lady, and that means she's never been through a proper Bible doctrines, or this is what we believe as Christians, not Church of God, not a Sims of God, not independence, not this or that, but this is what we believe according to the doctrines of the church of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's the difference. That's the difference. Bad doctrine can kill you. It can kill you. If I mention this name, some of you would know him and heard about him. I know you'd know him, 80% of you. But this preacher and some other preachers went on a mission trip some several years ago. And while they were over there on this trip, and uh, they got very ill, very ill. Some of the people died. One or two of the people died. And when they got back, you know, of course, they had to ship one back body back that had died. And in talking to them some years later, the whole part was, well, if God was sending us, if it was the will of God for us to go, then he was going to protect us, and we didn't need to take any kind of shots or medications to prevent anything. Now, I've been going in and out this January. will be 19 years. About January the 16th, coming up will be 19 years that I left this country, not for the first time, but into Africa. The first time I left, it was 1986. But for, for all those years, for all those years, I have always obeyed what the government has highly recommended to take as far as inoculations, shots, vaccines. I've always done that. We were in Kenya some years ago, and typhoid was just rampant. Typhoid was just seemed like everybody we were with uh, had been had a relative or something that came out of typhoid. Well, you know, you kind of deal with that. Well, what, what if you get it? But I had two things. Number one, had not I had the proper protection naturally, you would have spent most of your time using your faith to protect yourself and not having faith to minister to other people out there. I had another f- friend of mine that was in Kenya and uh, really felt the same way, uh, that uh, never took never took anything, never protected himself. If God sent me, God's been going to take care of me. And he got bit by something, and this was his exact words. I didn't even hardly have faith for the people because all I, all I could do was keep enough faith to keep myself alive. That tells me he was very ineffective. From that bite on, he was very ineffective. And so what this person said was, well, if God sent me, I don't need anything. I don't need anything to help me. You know, if God's, God's going to send me, I'm going to take it, or I'm not going to take anything, and he's going to protect me. But one person lost their life over it. Maybe two people lost their life over it. Wisdom would say if the government and everybody else says this is what you ought to have to go, then it's not a lack of faith to take that. And you go over there, and that's the last thing you're going to have to be concerned about, and you put more faith and energy on what you've got to do. But because of that doctrine, because of that doctrine, it almost cost him his life and cost somebody else's life. Bad doctrine can mess you up. 
That's why this is going to be so important for every teacher and, and other people and, and the people that get these and, and the, uh, the, the, the Bible schools that we have and everything else. This, these, these teachings will go into our Bible schools that we have here and around the globe. It's because if you have the right doctrines, you live and you live right. You have the wrong doctrines, it can take your life. It's very important that you have the right doctrines. So in these series of teachings when it comes to Bible doctrines, here's what you're going to be able to learn. You're going to learn what theology is. Theology. A lot of these words are going to be dealing with a suffix or the ending of O-L-O-G-Y, ology. Ology simply means the study of. The first part tells you what you're studying. So we will begin the next time we're together. Uh, we're going to study on God, theo, theology, the study of God. I love the study of God, man. I love to know what God is, the names of God in the Old Testament, the redemptive names of Jesus. I love to know who he is. Like we were in that Chicago area, and we were in that debate going on there. I'm surprised on how many people couldn't defend who God really was. It broke my heart. It put a resolve in me. I am going to know who I serve and who I believe. And that's what we have to have inside of us. It's not that you have to be a theologian and use all of these words. You just got to have the truth of it in your heart. These are the pillars or the foundations of which we build our life on. So we're going to talk about theology. We're going to talk about soteriology, the work of Calvary, the reason of the work, the fall of man, what Christ provided, why man fell, what happened to us when man fell, the work of the cross, what's the difference between atonements and what's the difference between redemption. And, and uh, I said for years and grew up that, that uh, healing was paid for in the atonement. And I said that until one day I realized that uh, healing was part of the Old Testament atonement. But in my study, atonement is not a New Testament word. Atonement was an Old Testament word. Uh, the word atone means to cover over. The blood of bulls and goats atoned. It covered over the sin of Israel and God's people for one year. But they had to go right back and get another goat or another bull, and they had to bleed it again so they could be atoned for another year. But when Jesus died on the cross, it said he went once and for all into the holies of holies and offered his blood upon the mercy seat of heaven to never again have to do it. And so his blood did not atone. It did not cover over. His blood completely washed the slate clean. So I'm going to, in this, in this area, we're going to talk about the importance of redemption and what it did. And that's, I'm stirred up even thinking about it. And I don't, I don't even have to wait 24 hours. And I'm already excited about it. It's the full work of the cross, the work of Calvary. We're going to talk about the deity of Christ, the blood, what it is. We're going to talk about pneumatology, pneuma, the Greek word for spirit. We'll talk about pneumatology, the, the spirit and, and how the spirit worked and, and different things that deals with that. The ordinance of the church, baptism, communion, foot washing, baptism of the Holy Spirit, sanctification, uh, uh, tithing principles. These are ordinances of the church that becomes doctrine inside of us. I've pastored this church for seven years, and, and I've never systematically ever sat down and took time to break all this down. I've been wanting to do it for a while, but this is going to make a big difference uh, in our life. And the reason why I'm doing it this way is because I want people to be able to get a hold of it on DVD and we'll be able to capture the truths of it. Because if you just do it on Sunday morning, some of the people, you know, get it and some people don't get it and you got new people coming. So if we do it this way, we have it libraried. We have it, we have it logged in and anybody at any given time will be able to get a hold of these doctrines to help them. We're going to talk about angelology, the study of angels. 
We'll also deal with the origin of angels and, and, uh, and what angels do and, and what they're designed and created to do. And also the same thing with, with demon spirits because in the interpretation of what we believe, there's two schools about the origin of demons and so forth. But I take them as, as fallen angels, the ones that I look at. So, but I'll, I'm going to show you both the other things that people believe. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the... Uh, ecclesiology or which we call the ecclesia uh the remember you hear words like the ecclesiastic church the ecclesia the the body of christ the called out ones we are the ecclesia we are the body and so we're going to be able to see this in a total different light and then we're going to look at eschatology the doctrine of the last days within this doctrine of the last days my heart has been very sensitive to what transpires in these last days, but a lot of people are confused of what's truly going to transpire in these last days. Now, I've had people tell me that I was wrong because there's three major beliefs on these last days. They have what they call a pre-trib belief or what people are pre-tribbers. That means that there's a tribulation. They all agree on one thing. There's going to be a tribulation. They all agree on there's going to be a tribulation. And the pre-trib says that before... The tribulation comes that the church is going to be raptured. Then you got the viewpoint of the mid-trib people or the mid-tribbers that believe somewhere in the midst of this tribulation, not at the beginning, but they're not going to go all the way through the hell of it, the, the, the whole wrath, they're not going to go through all the hell and the torment and the mental anguish they're not going to go through that, but somewhere in the middle, before that breaks out, they're going to be raptured. Now, somewhere between step one and step B, the Antichrist is going to be revealed. So they're going to be here during the revealing of the Antichrist. And then you got the post-tribbers that believe you're going to go all the way through it to the end. And then when it's all said and done, the rapture of the church is going to take place and it's all done. So you got the pre you got the mid and you got the post. The pre says, I'm out before it happens. The mid-tribber says, I'm going to be here, but I'm going to be out before it gets really, really, really bad. And the post-tribbers believe that they're going to be through all the bad and hoping that the pre-tribbers have been right the whole time. That's how this worked. I know is, the Bible says, that God will not suffer his people unto wrath. Somebody asked me, what are you, years ago? There's a lot of people joke about a lot of things. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a panner. I just believe the thing's going to pan out, you know. I don't even really joke along those lines because I believe there are scriptural ways to settle things. What do you believe? I remember the first thing when I was asked, because I preached for a lot of people that believed other, and I didn't want to get into the conversations with them. And so this came out of my mouth and uh, before I realized it, I said, uh, I'm pre-wrath. They said, what? I said, I'm pre-wrath. I said, the Bible says there's no way you can deny. I knew what stand they were in. I said, there's no way you can deny. God says, I will not suffer my children unto wrath. Is that what it says? I will not suffer my children to wrath. So whatever it happens before the wrath of God falls, I'm out of here. He will not suffer his children to wrath. So, my friend, I'm not arguing <laughs> doctrine. All I'm going to do is, that's what he says, I will not suffer my children unto wrath. Also, the Bible says that, that talking about the Antichrist, it says, it says uh, the son of perdition will not be revealed to, the, to that or they which restrain are taken away. So that means there's something or someone referred to as the body of Christ, it is the restraining factor. And until that restraining factor is removed, then the son of perdition cannot be revealed. Is that what the word says? So the whole point is, is it then that they say, as long as the church is here that restrains, then the Antichrist cannot be revealed because we're the one who restrains that? So we will talk about uh, ecle uh, the uh, ecclesiology. Uh, the, uh, the study of the last days. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, I think we've had, uh, to me, the most knowledgeable last day teacher, preacher there ever was.
preach from right here, and that is Dr. Hilton Sutton, who is currently in the presence of the Lord today. So uh, there's a lot of things that we look at. So what I want you to set your heart to is know how necessary it is. So you can bring your Bibles, you can bring your note pen, your notepads and your pens, and uh, let's really get into the purpose of what true Bible doctrines are. Because if we study to show ourselves approved, a man or woman is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And uh, we will give ourselves to the reading of the word, to exhortation, and to doctrine. And then all the other things will work to our benefit. Amen? So uh, we're going to be exactly what the Bible says. We're going to be good disciples. We're going to be good students of the word. And when we're good students of the word of God, life and health, peace and wholeness will be upon us forever. Amen. Thank God for the word. Thank God for good doctrine and for long life. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. We'll see you again.